at the Horn Museum and specifically on a current show, which is called Every Day to the Extraordinary, um, which has included a variety of different types of artists as Alicia that the, the Horn has an entire wing devoted to the visual arts of Asia, uh, thanks to a generous donation from the Coffrin family. So our speaker today is Alicia Payton, and she is the curator of this uh, Korean exhibition. Um, she's also the assistant curator of Asian art at the Horn and serves as a co-editor of, of a, a series, which is the David Coffrin uh, Asian Art Manuscript Series. And her research includes uh, South Asian art and the relationship between art of the subcontinent and the whole of Asia. Um, she's interested in such issues as Pan-American religion, well, excuse me, Pan-Asian religion, uh, food history, rituals, and performances. Um, uh, Alicia received her BA in studio art at Michigan State University. She then received a full scholarship to complete her MA in art history from the University of Miami. Um, she received a, a Korean Society Fellowship as well as numerous awards, such as the UF International Educator of the Year. Um, she's a member of the American Council for uh, Southern Asian Art, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing the study and awareness of art in the South and South Sea Asia. Uh, it, Peyton uh, has also taught honors courses at the University of Florida, humanities courses at Santa Fe College, and serves as an affiliate a faculty of the U.S. Center for the Study of Hindu Traditions. Um, there's a lot more I could say. She's done a lot of papers and things, but I will leave it there for now. Um, so now, uh, Alicia, I, it's your turn. <laughs> well, thank you very much for a great introduction. Um, and thank you for inviting me. I'm really pleased to be with you um, remotely today. Um, so I'm Elisa Payton, and uh, I was brought on to, um, I'm just going to do my tech stuff here. Let's see. I was brought um, on to the team of uh, Asian Curatorial back in 2010 to get ready for the new wing um, opening, which happened in 2012. And what I've been working on mostly uh, in the last year or so are these two exhibitions that we'll look at, um, Tempest Fugit and Every Day to the Extraordinary, and also um, the Coffer Manuscript series that uh, Laura mentioned. So I'll, um, I'll just get started. So Time Flies, um, this is the exhibition that's in the North Gallery. And the inspiration was this was, haha, the Tokyo Olympics happening in 2020. So. Um, Jason Stuber and I wanted to organize something that commemorated that very special event. Um, little that did we know that COVID-19 would completely change our plans forever and that this two-year exhibition would really teach us something further about um, time. So it's a big talk topic, time. It's like, you know, doing an exhibition about life or space. Um, so in order to narrow it down, um, we wanted to think uh, about our Japanese collections and especially some of the real rare gems that we'd never had on display before. Um, so time can be very personal. Um, your own awareness of temporality may shift um, during different decades of your life. Um, it can be very subjective based on what you're engaged in, what you're doing, but then there's also um, the cultural experience of time as well. So that's what we were looking at. And then I uh, delved into our Japanese collections. So we created a print gallery guide, which couldn't be used, of course, because we couldn't touch anything um, after the museum opened. Um, but we did translate it into uh, a digital research as well. So my primary interests were thinking about um, different types of time that could be, um, you know, tangibly studied through our Japanese collections. Um, and one of those was the idea of linear time. So time that goes that we can measure from beginning to end, you know, very much like a timeline or a lifeline. And we have a 51 foot scroll, hand scroll, in the collection by Ishiyama Tahaku. 
and he created this in uh, the 20, uh, 1920s. And usually a hand scroll is an interactive experience. So something that um, is taken out and shared with a group, unrolled one screen at a time. Um, and so there's a pause at each scene in order to uh, reflect or to examine or to appreciate. So it's very much, um, um, a, it's an occasion. It's a group among friends, you know, looking at things together, you know, something being taken out of the library. But because the scroll is so large, 51 feet and so oversized, um, the artist is clearly thinking about uh, challenging the tradition in that way. And I thought about challenging it even further because at the museum, we have to think about light levels and how long things can be displayed for. So in this two year exhibition, every six months, everything in the exhibition that's a work on paper gets shifted, including this hand scroll. So this is a spiritual journey from mountains to the sea. So every six months, a new section of this will be um, revealed to our visitors. And it's, I mean, for me, it's quite an occasion to see how it changes. You can see how still um, and spare it is at the end there. And of course, being a hand scroll in the East Asian tradition, it's read from right to left. Um, another thing we can think about um, with cultural time and with uh, Japanese art in particular is the beauty of the natural world or the life cycle of other uh, living beings and um, the ephemeral nature of that, you know. Um, so, for example, this cloisonne vase that greets you at the entrance of the gallery is the life cycle of a lotus blossom. So. Uh, longer than a fruit fly, um, but less than a human being, but quite short and something that can be um, enjoyed. So what the artist has done here in a very difficult medium is showed you um, the bud of the lotus. Um, you can see some of the leaves that are uh, curled up, some in, in the process of unfolding, some in the early stages of decay. Along the very top rim here, you can see a bat motif which is a symbol of life and longevity. Um, and if you imagine this, this large cloisonne vase uh, turning around, it's, it's very much um, a, a great exemplar of cyclical time. Um, then there's also uh, this okimono in the exhibition. It's a small sculpture. Um, and it's meant to be displayed in an alcove. And one of the things I love about this piece, um, also made in the 20s, is that um, it's really not particularly accurate in terms of a human skeleton, um, that it's curved out of burl wood. It's very delicate, very fragile, um, hinting at our own fragility. Um, but it's also uh, the aesthetic implied is one of uh, acceptance of, of vitality, even though it's showing kind of this, this underneath. So there's a lot of layers uh, that can be seen in here. Also thinking about um, the contrast with different materials. So one of the goals of the exhibition is to educate um, our visitors to what the museum does. And um, like I mentioned, the uh, works on paper, they can only be put up for a certain period of time, and then they have to go back to storage. And then there's other things that can be on display and are, are less um, uh, damaged by light, like rock or ceramic or cloisonne even. So this is a suiseki, uh, which means water stone. You may be familiar with some of the scholar rocks that the, uh, have been on view in the Asian wing before that have lots of holes. Well, the aesthetic in Japan is more these solid rocks, um, often collected at the coast, that have been, um, the artist is really nature. Um, it's made by the natural wear and erosion of water, sea salt, and wind. And then the selection of that piece to come back to the home for the scholar's study or for placement in the garden, that's really the act of, 
a, an act of creation itself. So you see, they have these beautifully carved wooden bases that fit the stone exactly. But what do you think is going to last longer? I think the stone probably will. Um, so that's an interesting twist uh, to consider when thinking about um, time longer than ourselves. Um, one story I often think about is a Buddhist temple that realized that um, that they have to do these really big renovations to the temple because of the wood uh, aging and decaying. And finding out that 400 years previous, uh, the monks had allowed for that and grown a particular stand of woods uh, in a nearby forest, um, thinking ahead 400 years to make sure um, that their, um, their predecessors would have the materials needed uh, to continue on. Another thing um, I was thinking about was the process. Um, time flies is a reference to, you know, those moments when you are really into something um, and, you know, where did the time go? You know, it seems like it accelerated and it's because of your um, deep focus into some activity. Um, so woodblock printing is a great example of that. Um, each color represents a different uh, block that has been carved away um, in the negative, and then each color is printed so, um, separately onto a piece of paper with registration blocks. So what I find fascinating about this is that um, the artist carving away little by little um, that long production time, and yet you can portray something like a spontaneous moment, something that happens very quickly, like the wind that's moving these, um, this wheat or these grasses in the foreground of this print. We have some real treasures in the exhibition, as I mentioned. Um, we have four scrolls in the Harns collection uh, by Watanabe Shotai. And he is a very, very interesting artist. He's somebody who, um, after the opening of Japan, um, after um, Matthew Commodore Perry uh, landed in Japan in 1853, and then suddenly this very isolated island nation was open to all these influences in the West. So he um, participated in an exhibition in Paris, the International Exposition in 1878. He traveled to America, he was awarded several medals, and he really absorbed um, so many influences, but maintained this tradition of the Nihonga or the traditional Japanese hanging scroll format. So his work is really um, a syncretism between this Western realism, I mean, that bird is very convincingly um, perched on that branch and looking straight at you. And you have the, um, the almost calligraphic ink and uh, color on paper um, that he's sitting on. And also, again, there's that spontaneous moment. I'm convinced this, this bird has just landed. You can see um, where he's landed that the snow has been pushed off the branch. So a special moment um, that's been executed in this um, in this, this, this long production time. And, and of course, if you've been to the exhibition, you know that, you know, I'm kind of making a funny, um, cause there's a lot of birds in the show. So time flies, lots of birds and bats and dragonflies, things that are airborne. Um, Watanabe went on to work with one of the two Namikawa, uh, Cloisne artists in 18, 50s, 60s, uh, Japan, and it was a very special time in cloisonne production, something where each color is placed in, there's uh, wires between the colors, and they developed together uh, a new te technique called musen, which is like a, a wireless cloisonne, or nearly wireless, and it enabled the artist to um, execute something that's, you know, almost painterly. Um, so the bird on your right, the white bird, um, it's really, it's a gradation of white and gray. And the only place that you can um, see the wires close up is in the feet. Um, as we 
approach the year-long milestone um, of the opening of the exhibition, um, we shifted into uh, another period of time that was important, which is Japanese modernism. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of things were happening in the print world in Japan. So um, artists after World War II were thinking, you know, we want to keep tradition, but we want to um, include other influences. Um, so you have artists that are in a new print movement. They want to revitalize print making, um, but also incorporate Western influences. But then they're also doing this uh, traditional technique of uh, carver, printer, designer, um, publisher. So here you can see um, Misufuni uh, often does these abstracted bird designs. And then you have another print school, um, the creative print movement, Saku Hanga, which um, where they the artists said, no, we need to do everything ourselves. So uh, this artist here, Sakino, he did all of the carving, the printing, the designing himself. Um, and so this moment of tension between traditionalism, modernism, globalism um, is something in Japan um, that is examined by the exhibition. I talked a little bit about um, the cloisonné process here. Um, also, the role of women uh, really changed uh, during this time period. So, and it's not just in Japan, but all over this kind of broad transformation as industrialism um, gains, gains steam, literally. Um, and then public buildings in Japan, like this one you see on the right, um, this one is done in a diverse range of Western styles. So this one looks very art deco. Um, you can see the people in the foreground looking um, very, very stylish in Western dress. Um, and the kind of the new woman or the moga is uh, the modern Japanese woman who all of a sudden has more opportunities for employment um, in terms of education, secondary school opens up to uh, ceramic artists and print artists. So um, everything is changing. Um, and I think, you know, the print on the left, the breakaway printed in English is um, a great metaphor for all this change. Uh, so I think aesthetically in this one, you can see um, kind of that shift between the realism again in that flat space in the back. Uh, this is probably um, the setting of a coffee or tea house. And then going backward in time, um, this is an, a bodhisattva sculpture from the 18th century and a puzzle from our collection. It was really difficult for uh, scholars in that I consulted in Japan and within the United States to identify uh, what bodhisattva this is. So a bodhisattva is a being who reaches nirvana but stays, uh, stays on the earth to help others. And the iconography associated with each one is very particular. So this was very tentatively um, ascribed to the um, bodhisattva of canon who usually only has the one head. In this one, there are actually four. There's one on the side here, and there's one um, that's kind of implied in the back. And Canon usually uh, doesn't wear a robe like this or have the prayer mudra, Anjali mudra, uh, in the center. Whereas, um, so anyway, a puzzle, and we decided that we're going to take this uh, over to Shans to figure out a little bit more. Uh, you may recall in the Korean collection that we had a bodhisattva that had sutra pages uh, inside the body. So I was curious to find out um, what some clues um, that we could determine by looking at these. So the idea of simultaneous time, um, I'm going to show you this short video first and then I'll talk about what we discovered from uh, the x-rays and the CAT scans.
Okay, so what we discovered is that, sorry, oh boy, um, is that this sculpture was probably originally created to be um, the historical Buddha because of the robe and the Anjali Mudra, and that um, the way that the the CAT scan showed the wood grain and how things, these arms were added afterward. You can also see the original metal staples that were used. They're very kind of rough hewn. And you can see where it was repaired with these much more mechanized cells. So this would be sometime in the early 20th century afterward, probably when the sculpture traveled to London um, to the dealer where the Harn acquired um, the object from. So, it tells us a lot about the history of Buddhism in Japan and kind of that um, that evolution from historical Buddha to the canon, who's a God, uh, Bodhisattva of mercy. Um, and we also know that this crown was added afterward. So really through scientific analysis, um, what appeared to be and what we put on the label, 18th century, um, isn't the whole story. So let's get into every day to the extraordinary, which is really a continuation of the spirit of investigation and uh, interdisciplinary look at our collections. Um, when I was in Seoul, I was really impressed how um, you could have um, a painting in the background, uh, kind of a kitschy ceramic icon there, and then bottled waters and and things as offerings. So you have these uh, extraordinary elements, this um, you know fine art alongside with um, uh, objects from living tradition. And, and I'll talk about this image a little bit more in the future. Um, it was also a culmination of many, many years of uh, research and conservation into the collection. So um, even though it's the smallest number of objects in uh, geographically, um, the Korean collection have some of the most extraordinary objects um, represented, starting with um, gifts in 1989 from General James Van Fleet, Van Fleet, and then continued with acquisitions and generous donations since then. And so it's the only gallery in the Harn Asian Wing and the museum that is dedicated to a single nation. So, um, Several, uh, a few scrolls really are extraordinary pieces, uh, one by Kim Hong Do and one by Kim Yun Ho, uh, along with the sutra pages from inside that Bodhisattva I mentioned earlier. They've gone uh, to Korea, uh, traveled there in order to be conserved by an expert in uh, Korean, uh, Korean art history and conservation. So within the gallery, uh, you'll see panels like this that explain the process, uh, explain the research, um, and give our visitors a little bit more information. Um, the design is modeled after Korean which is wrapping cloth. Oftentimes it looks like, uh, almost like a quilt with little pieces of fabric that have been stitched together. Um, and so we went with that, um, thinking of it as kind of, um, you know, this culmination of research and study and also kind of a gift uh, to the Gainesville community. Um, I also wanted to think about uh, different levels in, of engagement in education. So thinking about our youngest visitors coming in, um, having something for them, symbolism through dragons and tigers and um, flowers, and then also having something for you know our most learned scholars. So I try to make sure that we have a lot of different layers, but how do you do that in the gallery walls when, when you have a limited number of space? Um, so you can't put a bunch of text panels. So the idea was to have a touch table. <laughs> um, another, another venture that was um, changed drastically by uh, COVID-19. So our touch table and all of this, um, um, all these resources and content that was associated with the objects from the permanent collection, things that went outside of the realm of the visual arts uh, was kind of stuck on this touch table for a while. And we had to figure out a way to convert it uh, to the website itself. So here you see the gallery. Uh, we received um, a very generous grant from the National Museum of Korea. And it is a continuation with our connection with them 
Um, they're conserving four scrolls right now that will return um, in time for the next change out, perhaps. Um, but also um, a renovation with new casework. So you can see uh, this case here, it has, um, and these here, they have presence monitors. So when you step in, um, it will be a little bit dark in the gallery. And then as you get closer, the objects will light up, which is, it's dramatic, it's beautiful, but it's also most importantly, really good for conserving the objects over time and keeping their light levels low. Um, you can also see there's a video that's projected here. So sound and, and the other fine arts are being incorporated. Um, this is another view. And uh, through the touch table and the website and other materials, we also wanted to connect to the um, incomparable collections of the National Museum of Korea. Um, to talk about uh, objects like this, these would be wall hangings, you know, something that would be hung up for the new year um, with the iconography of the tiger and the dragon, um, protective auspicious spirits, um, things that you would um, hang up and then take down everyday objects that have been saved and now have a new context. We really think of them as fine art. And so over time, our understanding of what fine art and folk art will shift. So something that was created for everyday use can also be considered um, extraordinary. So I'm in the touch table. It was organized by timeline. And so I'm just going to briefly, just look at my time here, briefly go through um, a few of the objects in the exhibition and, and get a little, um, a few stories uh, to uh, make these more than the objects that they are. So more than just appreciating them aesthetically. So starting with the Three Kingdoms era, uh, Korea was uh, divided into three separate kingdoms, the Bakja, Ashila, and the Gurgur Guru. And a lot of the works uh, found from this area were found in tombs, their stoneware. Um, and so referencing um, the archaeology or the, it gives us an insight into a belief of the afterlife. Um, and this period goes from, you know, 57 before the common era all the way to 668. Um, unified under the Shilla dynasty. Um, this is an object you can see has very um, finely stamped designs in neatly organized registers. Um, the Shilla Tong War, in the seventh century, basically expelled the protectorate of the Tang Dynasty and unified Korea for the very first time. In the Goryeo Dynasty, it was a major, major period of trade. Um, and this is a, a Maebyeong uh, Celadon vessel that's on view in the exhibition. And so the backstory to this object, a beautiful object, and we, we describe this uh, in terms of the body. So you have the a curved mouth, rim, a basically non-existent neck, a rounded shoulder, a constricted waist, uh, the foot of the vessel, um, something that we can appreciate aesthetically from the inlaid um, clay and the sangam, the design of the, of the bird and the willow tree and that symbolism. But also if we dig a little bit deeper, like I mentioned, this is an um, uh, important period, a important time of trade. It was very, uh, definitely a golden age of Celadon production. Um, and a lot of vessels we found find are from shipwrecks. And one of, one of the nice things about that is that often they'll be accompanied by the wooden tags that describe their contents. And often a vase like this would be considered, um, you know, a prunus vase, something to display flowers. But originally it may have been something to, or we know it has been, something to transport other types of liquid like honey and alcohol and sesame oil.
And the color of Celadon um, is very coveted because for thousands of years in Asia, uh, jade has been valued over gold and sil silver. And so you can see that connection between the hue of the Celadon green um, and uh, the jade. So it's a very difficult stone to carve, um, you know, just super, super valuable. So to emulate that in uh, a medium like ceramics, um, you know, the Goryeo period Celadons are considered some of the finest in the world. So when we get to the Joseon dynasty, there's major changes afoot. Um, even though it was a period of great artistic production, it was the Goryeo period was dominated by uh, the Mongols. And um, during the Joseon, there's attempt to reunify um, of Korea, a rejection of Buddhism, um, a return to more Confucian ideals. So uh, Confucianism, not exactly a religion, but more a system of relationships, um, honoring your elders, honoring your family. Um, and you'll see the art of this period uh, changes a little bit. It becomes a little bit more austere. Um, in China, uh, at this time, it was the fall of the Ming Dynasty. And uh, let's see, around 1644. And from this period on, you can see a trend in Korean art that trends towards um, pride in Korean, more Korean produ uh, production. So more nationalist pride, uh, promoting their own culture. So a symbol like the tiger, for example, which is common throughout East Asia, East Asia uh, Koreans um, use more in iconography. So it's associated with the mountain god. It's associated with uh, creation myth, um, associated with the Korean people themselves. Um, Korea was once known as the land of tigers. Unfortunately, now um, they've been hunted to extinction maybe because of that. And then dragons. Uh, dragons also, um, you could think of as being omnipresent in East Asian culture. Um, but there's one thing particular about the Korean dragon. Um, the, the farther you get from China, um, the, the more toes the, the dragon has. So here you see this dragon has four toes. Uh, the ones in Japan will have five. Um, the dragon, as I mentioned before, was a, a protector, um, um, someone who expelled uh, evil spirits often associated with water imagery. And there's other symbolism to be found in the gallery as well. Um, like this really uh, rare, extraordinary uh, hexagonal bottle to your left, this blue and white por porcelain. It shows the chrysanthemum, which symbolizes constancy. Uh, it always blooms in late autumn, despite the frost. So it was a very hardy plant. Um, the symbol for life here with some um, conch shells that reference Buddhism and the symbol of the, the peony, um, symbol of wealth, happiness, marital bliss. So an object like these, um, these ritual vessels, they can be appreciated all on their own. You notice they're very austere, plain, white. Um, they would be collected by uh, Yangban or the elite or uh, noble class. Um, and then there's a little bit more context in the, in the touch table to give an idea of what um, some sort of um, ancestral rite was look like, a setting, um, where at the foreground you have the incense burner. Um, smoke is something that's um, appreciated or, or, or even it offered to the ancestors. And then there's a very specific order to where these vessels um, hold uh, foodstuffs. And then here's the memorial tablet. Okay, a little bit more about the aesthetics of Neo-Confucianism. You see um, the cup, the stem cup in our collection. In a ritual setting, it would be held with both, both hands. Um, and also um, in the touch table and the website, there's links to um, 
objects in the National Museum of Korea collection and sometimes further afield, uh, depending, um, and related objects. Um, um, this is a Ming Dynasty stem cup. All right, so I have a mystery for you. Um, the scroll on the right hand side is done by Kim Hong Do and is one of the uh, treasures in our collection that's just been conserved. Um, we know from this auction catalog in 1937 that it also had a companion scroll, which is now missing. The one on the right was donated in 1989 to the Harn uh, by General uh, James A. Van Fleet. Uh, and the whereabouts of this left scroll is unknown. So this is a scroll itself. Uh, Kim Hong Do was a famous uh, court painter, and he was really interested in, in his genre paintings of all types of people from um, the noble class to the peasant class. Um, he modeled this scene after a famous um, um, album of illustrated Tong poems. So you see the scene there is very similarly replicated. Um, and in the uh, resource material, there's more uh, information about genre painting and some related objects to go with it. That way, it kind of opens the door to uh, further levels of explanation. Um, also available are the conservation reports for the paintings that have been conserved. So you can see here is a before and after. There was significant uh, creasing from being rolled and unrolled over time. Um, this painting underwent chemical analysis. Um, and the Harn's position on conservation and also the studio in Seoul is very much that um, things aren't overpainted, but preserved to the best uh, state possible. Uh, so this is a glimpse of the website and um, just on the Harns website, the exhibition, and you can see down at the bottom here, this is the link that will take you into some of this additional uh, supplemental content. So if you click on, uh, for example, the timeline and you're interested in this painting here, you'll learn more about the living tradition of, of shamanism and other objects from either the NMK or other museum collections. And as mentioned in the video, um, we were looking uh, to find out if this uh, guardian figure had any objects that were kept inside. Um, now he is a guardian that works in uh, City Garba's court and he has um, an ink pen and calligraphic scrolls to record the names of the dead. And City Garba's role is that he is gonna take care of all beings um, between the death of the historical Buddha, Shakyamuni, until the Buddha of the future, Maitreya. And so on the website, you can look through, do a fly through of the CT scans. We found out that it's um, uh, definitely a single tree. Uh, we saw the object had some evidence of insect infestation. It's a super, super rare sculpture, um, which why it's, it has central placement in the gallery. Uh, it was collected in the 1950s by a US Army Reserve officer. And from this picture here, you can see it was kept in his garden outside. So <laughs> everyday object um, that's really, really extraordinary. Um, I was gonna talk to you a little influence of Buddhism and Taoism and shamanism, but I think I'm running out of time, but I do wanna point you to um, a fantastic lecture that I just watched at Stony Brook uh, and it's available online by really um, the expert on Korean shamanism, Laurel Kendall. So um, this is the other extraordinary scroll painting in the exhibition by Kim Yunho, who worked in uh, Japan for a period of time. Um, also um, uh, merged together aspects of Western realism and East Asian traditional painting. Um, this is from the 1922 exhibition um, under colonial um, uh, Japanese um, government in Korea. 
there's information on how this has been conserved um, and cleaned. And in the gallery, uh, there's a video of this um, dance, Sung Mu, a, a traditional Buddhist monk's dance, that's very, very much alive, um, a living tradition that's practiced um, today. And that's what these um, subjects are doing in this garden setting. And I think lastly, uh, I'll talk to you about this Munjado Chakuri screen. Um, this would be held in all sorts of different households in Korea. And the reason I like it uh, in our UF uh, University Museum Gallery is because it's a reminder. It's a reminder for students that they need to be studying. Um, these are the values, are your Confucian values. There's some books and things. Um, it's going to tell you all about um, the things, the Confucian values you should be practicing. And then it will have uh, objects, or books and things. That's what Munjado means. Books and things uh, that show you um, luxury items, um, export goods, pretty much a still life. Um, and they have a functional quality as well. Like you could probably see, they divide rooms up. So um, a great reminder for students to get their studying done. And then there's some really more common objects in the exhibition, um, like this rice cake mold. Um, you can see a few of them there, along with a beautiful ladle. Um, and images that, um, you know, talk about everyday Korean cuisine. This is one of the amazing meals that I had when I was in Seoul. And then, um, I'll talk to you about this uh, publication that is available from the University of Florida Press, which is a symposium um, that Jason and I organized and the authors um, published their proceedings. And it was the winner, winner of the uh, Marion Lepresti Award and available on their website. And we also have a link to a collection site through uh, UF Smathers Library that talks more about the history of the Korean collection, uh, individual objects, more about the symposium. And so that's um, that opens our, our, our visitor uh, base to uh, a much larger audience than the ones who walk through the door. And um, during this you know, strange pandemic time, you know, uh, can be accessible to you as well. I think I've talked too long, I'm sorry. Um, but thank you, I'm done. And I'm looking forward to your all your comments and questions. Hi again. Uh, so that was amazing. Thank you so much for that. Um, and we still have plenty of time uh, for questions and answers. Um, so Great. while people have some time to think of those, they can send them in the chat or again, uh, raise hand function and please keep them brief so that we can get to everyone's. Uh, to begin with, I will throw it over to Laura Burns. I just, just to begin. Thank you so much. I found it very stimulating. And uh, I think it would encourage a lot of us to not only come to the museum to see this, but also maybe to do a bit more reading and research into uh, you know, the culture and the art in those periods. So I thought that's, that was a really a nice uh, thing that you added in there, Alicia. Um, I think people know that uh, the museum is back open up again now, back to its regular hours. In fact, a bit extended. It starts, it opens at 10 and then it's mm -hmm. every day it, it, well, from 10 to 5, uh, from Tuesday to Saturday, and then on Sunday it's in the afternoon and then it's closed on Monday. But uh, so yeah, there are plenty of opportunities to come. I, I want to leave it up. I'll stop at that and let people ask their questions. So, okay, Lance. Thank you. Uh, so to begin, I see uh, that Richard Petway has a quick question. Uh, Richard, you're, you're still muted. Thank you so much, Consomni uh, Da. Uh, it was a, such a pleasure to see you again and to hear about Korean art and uh, in a wider context. And I guess to some extent, my question is about um, uh, Silla versus Pekche, uh, which were the 
two of the three regions, um, the historical regions, or even, uh, you said, kingdoms. And I was kind of interested uh, for you to give me a, a comparative in contrast uh, between these. Um, uh, there were many kind of warlike motions between Pekche and Scylla. Um, I actually studied the Korean language in Kwonju, uh, South Korea, which is uh, in, in the Pekche region. And they convinced me that it was the best, but I'm sure if I studied in another area, they would have done the same. But I, I, I didn't know what representations that these different kingdoms had. Of course, one was Seoul itself, um, but that's uh, just become an employment and educational area and not really has a separate identity. And I learned that people in Seoul would vote like their fellow uh, wherever they were locally from. So if they came from a Pekche area or a Silla area, they would vote accordingly. And I'm kind of curious if there was ever any identifying arc that was uniquely different between these particular historical uh, uh, areas. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, one thing that I was struck by when I was um, traveling through Korea is that um, there would be a museum, for example, for the Shilla dynasty, which is famous for its gold production. Um, and we would walk through this complex of tombs and they would say, well, everything from this museum is from this tomb, tomb number 312 or whatever. And then there would be hundreds of other tombs around them. And I'd say, well, what about those? And they'd say, well, we have enough. We have everything we need. And so <laughs> something I don't think would happen here um, necessarily um, really impressed me. But a lot of the information we have between the Beccha and the Shilla is from these archaeological archaeological excavations. And because we're talking about um, two kingdoms that are in the south, um, and also this huge time period, you know, before the common era, all the way up to the seventh century, there are several um, studies that talk about the differences between artistic production be the, between the two. Um, but I think it would be like a whole other lecture. And I think what I'll do is <laughs> I'll shoot you an email afterward um, with a couple links that I have that might um, might be illuminating to some of those time periods. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, up next, we have a question from Anne Marie Rizzo, Rizzo, I apologize if I got that wrong. Um, and they ask, how did you come to your passion for Asian and especially Korean art? And Anne-Marie, if you have anything else to add, please feel free to unmute. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, let's see. Well, um, as Laura mentioned earlier, uh, I, I received my BA in studio art uh, from Michigan State University. And uh, I did a lot of ceramics, so I know a bit about making clay and uh, throwing on a wheel. And one of the things um, my instructor did is said to, you know, look backwards, look to the past, look at other forms of production. So long story short, I made a lot of tea bowls, so many tea bowls. Um, and I did a lot of studying for different uh, production techniques. I had um, a classmate who was from Japan who I would give her coffee and she would give me sweets from the tea ceremony. Um, and we would talk about um, different aesthetics. So that I think I think that might be uh, the beginning. Um, and when I went on to do my graduate work, I was I was working in contemporary art, but really looking at a contemporary artist Francesco Clemente, Italian artist who uh, traveled back and forth between Italy and um, North India and how Indian culture affected his aesthetics and his research. And so um, after coming to the Harn and uh, meeting Jason Stuber, um, my 
the realm was kind of opened up much further to more about East Asia and especially Korean. And because the Harn has so many really um, just masterpieces of Korean art, um, a lot of the thrust of our research and energy for conservation and for funding um, uh, went towards that. And then of course the symposium was this huge experience where we had international scholars coming in and um, just learning from them uh, was amazing. So that Arts of Korea book that I mentioned, um, it's really, it can function as a doorstop if you need it. It is the largest volume. It's something like almost 500 pages. So, so yes, that is my answer. <laughs> And please don't be shy, anyone else, if you have questions generally about the Harn or, or anything in particular, um, there's so much happening at the museum right now. Well, thank you. We, we still have some time. So if, again, if people have any questions, feel free to send me a chat or raise, use the raise hand function. Uh, I see Laura Burns has <laughs> raised their hand, so I will jump back over to them real quick. My question is, this is coming from, you know, if when you, when I see uh, Asian art, and I think a lot of people do it, actually the arts from China and Korea and Japan sort of blend together and, and seem very similar. So I guess what I'm interested in knowing, if when you see, let's say, uh, a piece of art, let's say a vase or a scroll that comes from Korea, um, are there particular things that you say oh, you could say ah this this is Korean? Sure, sure. That's a great question. Um, uh, and I'll go back to something that Richard said earlier that when he was in Bekja, uh, that area, that they said that theirs was the best. <laughs> and that's the clue: is that yes, these countries are very close to each other, but they they are very very particular about the differences. So in Korean art, in particular. Um, you saw those stamped registers with the incised lines. Um, that's very um, a typical of the Shilla dynasty um, and Korea in particular. And the celadons of the Goryeo, there's just no equal um, in other production. Whereas, um, you know, the blue and whites of China, for example, are really the exemplars of that um, medium. Um, another uh, technique that I really love is rubbing of the slip into a darker clay body. And what's happening now is because, of course, our world is getting smaller and smaller and artists travel back and forth, even though maybe they always did with the Silk Road. Um, because the world is getting smaller, you have a Japanese artist who's borrowing a Korean technique and thinking about um, you know, a, a tradition that started or because of uh, materials gathered from Persia, uh, it all it all blends together. But when you go further back in time, it becomes e easier, I think, to delineate these movements. Um, but I mean, you can do it yourself. Just go go in and look at the um, the big case in the Axe Line Gallery with all the Chinese ceramics, and then go over to Korea, um, and you, and you'll see the differences. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Looks like this would be a game you could play. Right? <laughs> Which country did this come from? <laughs> you know, I, I play that game often when I go into museums. I ignore the labels for a while um, and uh, I try to identify things, you know, based on uh, a lot of times region of illustrated manuscript in India. Um, so, yes, play the game. I have another question here. Uh, it is from, again, from Anne-Marie Rizzo. They say, I don't know much about Asian art, but would like to know which institutions sponsor Asian collections in the US. Who do you network with? Ooh, I have this fantastic network. Um, I actually run the lists, listserv and I'm on the steering committee for a group called the American Curators of Asian Art. And so we have this fantastic group um, of curators who work um, not only in the United States, but also in um, Mexico and Canada, 
who get together uh, once a year and have a forum and talk to each other about um, current projects and traveling exhibitions and research. So um, we're a close knit group of, of researchers and scholars who work together, but traveling around the United States or are thinking about, um, you know, the really important collections. Um, of course, there's a Metropolitan Museum um, that you can get lost in for days. There's a San Francisco Asian Art Museum, but also the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, the Cleveland Museum of Art has an amazing collection. Um, let's see, I'm thinking about Korean art now. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the other big Korean collection, but I think like going to the San Francisco uh, Asian Art Museum page, um, you'll see uh, a lot of links to, um, to greater content there. And the Hard Museum is actually, um, has one of the, the best collections of Asian art in the Southeast United States. So, um, and I think that's what inspired um, Dr. Coffrin and the Coffrin family to dedicate the, the entire Asian wing. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, we are at 11, so uh, I, I don't think anyone has any more questions. Um, so thank you so much for, for being with us today. I'm, it was an amazing talk. Everyone really appreciates it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. And I hope to see everybody at the museum. Yes. Thanks, Alicia. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.